Scholars Unbound is a bi-monthly podcast or video series that showcases the voices of scholars who know no boundaries when it comes to the pursuit of knowledge. You will hear insights from their experiences as international scholars and how these influence their research, hoping to inspire future scholars to be fearless, global, and unbound. I'm your host, Dalia Simangan. In today's episode, I will be talking to Dr. Michael McCamid, a good friend of mine and an excellent scholar. Mike is the recipient of the prestigious Marie Skladovska Curie Fellowship. He is affiliated with the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary University of London. So Mike and I go way back, almost two decades ago. We first met when we were um, this idealistic undergrads at the University of the Philippines in Diliman. We then became classmates when we were both doing our master's degree in international studies at the same university. Um, I did not get my master's degree there. (laughs) I got it somewhere else. So that graduate program uh, is known to be one of the most difficult graduate programs in the university. And of course, Mike completed it with flying colors as expected. We then became colleagues at a government owned company in the Philippines after that. In fact, um, I got I got that job because of Mike's recommendation. And during those days, I remember we were strategizing how to move our academic careers forward. And we were convinced that the best way is to get a PhD. So not long after that, Mike moved to New Zealand to start his PhD. And then months later, I moved to Australia for my PhD. And because of this, I cannot think of a better way to start the show than having Mike as my first guest. So ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dr. Michael McCavitt. Mike, welcome to the show. It's an honor and a pleasure to be your first guest in the show, which I'm sure will be highly, highly successful. So thank you. Uh, we know that this, uh, the current pandemic is um, affecting our lives one way or another. I'm wondering what makes you occupied these days, despite this ongoing um, health crisis. Sometimes, I, mean, I, th- I told you about this in several occasions during our informal conversations. And I told you that there are times when I feel that my research work is rather futile, given what's been happening um, in the world right now. but you know, I always tell myself that in my own little way, at least through my research and through my teaching, I hope that I can somehow contribute to the uh, society. And that's always been my main mission, so to speak. But uh, just to answer your question briefly, uh, this past, these past couple of years, I've been uh, busy working on my Marie Curie research project that is being funded by the European Commission. Last year, the, before the COVID-19 pandemic erupted, I traveled to Southeast Asia to conduct field work in Indonesia, in Myanmar, and the Philippines. And uh, since returning to London in December of last year, I have been working on various publications for this research project, including journal articles, policy briefs, and my second book manuscript, which I have just submitted to the editor. And in between researching and writing, I've been carrying out some knowledge transfer activities to disseminate some of the initial findings from my study to the wider public while uh, occasionally serving as a resource person for some public talks and discussions in Southeast Asian politics. So Mike, you've recently published an article entitled Imagine Insecurities in Imagine Communities. I love the title um, for the International Studies uh, Quarterly. Um, I believe this is also one of the outcomes of your current research, right? So what is your research about? Yeah, you know, now, um, and you're very familiar with this, you know, growing up in a very unstable and highly unequal society in the Philippines, it has become my personal advocacy to dedicate my academic and pedagogical works in providing a more nuanced, holistic and useful understanding of security and insecurity, both from the perspectives and experiences of state units and human societies. And as such, my research and teaching activities sit at the intersection of what we call traditional and non-traditional security studies, critical conflict and peace theories and new political economy. So these are the three, these are categorized into three general strands, namely security and conflict, security and political economy, and security and state actors. So in every research project that I develop and implement, and every lecture that I deliver to my students and to the public, whether it's about violent ethno-religious conflicts, like the article that you mentioned, or unfair trade practices, or regrettable foreign policies, 
the main unifying theme and mission is to encourage my audience and my readers uh, to question the prevailing in institutional structures and social constructs that we have and help find ways to create more equal, more humane and more and, and just societies across the world. So that's, I mean, I'm sorry to sound very serious about this, but that's really the main uh, impetus behind my research works and teaching activities. So that's a very interesting and also very inspiring research agenda um, and maybe also controversial. Um, what, did, what made you decide to uh, explore this uh, topic in your research? Yeah, uh, you know, while doing fieldwork across Southeast Asia for different projects and on different occasions, I have met a lot of people who are, you know, just like me, with the same, if not even more talent, definitely greater strength of resolve and higher level of grit. Only they have never received a single privilege in their lifetime. And as my way of paying it forward, I'm doing my best to live a life that's of use to others, particularly through my research and teaching. In all of my academic endeavors, I always remind myself and the people in my circles, and we've discussed this a lot of times while we were having our drinks at some Tokyo bars, um, about our you know, ethical responsibility to do our best to achieve wonderful things with our privileges, all the while advocating for those who are being excluded, silenced, and left behind. And I hope I'm somehow contributing to this kind of responsible and inclusive culture in the academia. Thank you so much, Mike, for doing this uh, kind of research, which I'm sure benefits you not just academically, but also um, those people that you've interviewed along the way and those people who work with you. So when I was uh, introducing this show, this episode, I was talking about how we were strategizing, where we were still planning our PhD. Um, so why did you choose to do your PhD in New Zealand? And um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> related to that as well is that um uh you've stayed there for like four four years yeah yeah so right so what are the positive aspects of also doing your phd at the university of canterbury in new zealand for me new zealand is one of the most progressive and most livable countries in the world and the government and the society value the principles that i personally subscribe to including human rights democratic freedom social equality and respect for nature which in my view are fundamental to living a happy and meaningful life so when I was awarded a New Zealand government scholarship, I immediately accepted the offer and did not wait to hear my other applications. Uh, since 2012, I've had the opportunity to live and work in different countries. And I can say that New Zealand is in many ways truly special. It's the first country that gave me a sense of what it's like to have equal constitutional rights with others, fortunately or fortunately. And I'll be forever grateful for that. And I was also very fortunate to have met my PhD supervisor from Canterbury, um, his name is Professor Alex Tan, and my other colleagues from the Department of Political Science and International Relations, who provided me with enormous su um, support and respect for my research and teaching. Professor Tan, in particular, has more than fulfilled and went beyond his duty as you know, supervisor by acting as a father figure. He gave me enough space to develop and use my own independent voice and style as a researcher and you know, as an educator. And he did all of this while ensuring the robustness, the rigor, and the quality of my research work, which is not always an easy balance, I think. And you know, our department is relatively small, but everyone contributes to the advancement of our discipline and the New Zealand society through, their, through our respective research and teaching activities. And the best part for me was being treated and accepted as an equal member of the academic community rather than just you know, a student who was expected to just follow orders, and, and I deeply, deeply appreciate that. So, Mike, you've had um, amazing experience as a PhD student in New Zealand, but I'm wondering what are also the challenges that you've encountered as a um, um, scholar overseas, and um, how did you overcome them? Oh, okay. Um, on the professional level, let's, let's, let's begin that. Um, the biggest challenge for me is, you know, managing the pressure of having to constantly prove myself as an international scholar. Uh, the international academic community, as you know, is home to some of the most extraordinarily brilliant and talented people in the world. And while that may be inspiring, um, however, it is also highly competitive. And given the current state of the academic job market, where there is an oversupply of PhDs and very limited number of positions available, it's it, you know, it can really get bloody competitive and, and at times even toxic and depressing 
in fact, many academics are confronting various mental health issues, which to a large extent are triggered by the problem and challenges that they face in academia. And things can get even more challenging if when you're a foreign person of color academic from a developing country like myself. So somehow I can't help but feel the need to work harder and produce more than the rest in order to justify my presence here and establish myself as a respectable scholar. And to, to be clear, uh, my colleagues from the different institutions that I've worked for thus far in, in New Zealand, in Japan, and then here in the UK have all been very welcoming and supportive. Uh, but because of the current market-driven government policies that are underpinning the academia, at least in this part of the world, um, you know, many, many are disproportionately being disadvantaged. I have, um, especially, especially the uh, uh, Black, Asian, and minority ethnic scholars. And this is the reason why I have joined the UK University and College Union to show my solidarity and support in my fellow academics, um, especially those who are aggrieved by the current system. So that's on the more uh, professional level. However, on a, on a more personal level, um, I don't want to bore you with this, but uh, let me just share it anyway. And, and I think many Filipino scholar, scholars who are trying to make it outside the Philippines right now um, could probably relate. Um, the biggest challenge for me is creating a sense of home you know, in which I can anchor myself. Having lived and worked in several different countries and since 2012, somehow I've kind of lost my idea of a home. Uh, from an academic standpoint, I question the philosophical ideas behind nations, behind states, behind territories, and we probably share some of those, you know, critics that and and you know I tell myself that because I am first and foremost a citizen of the world, um, the world as a whole is the conceptual home to which you know I should weave my vision and my identity. But by doing that, um, the idea of home becomes even more amorphous, which makes it difficult to have that sense of belonging. Sometimes I, I feel like I'm neither here nor there, you know, like I'm just floating and above with, with nothing to ground me. But I guess, I guess that the kind of confusion is one of the trade-offs that I have to make for choosing this lifestyle. <laughs> to be clear, I love the idea of being able to experience life in different cultural contexts and pursuing and living that kind of life inevitably comes with you know different challenges and the goodness is that right now those challenges still haven't worn me out i still have the stamina and the willingness to go through such confusions just to discover my life's meaning not just as, a, as an academic but you know as a human thank you mike for sharing such an um, honest answer and what you said uh, resonates with me as well. Since 2012, I left the Philippines and um, moved uh, in different parts of the world. And um, as, like you, I also see myself as a global citizen. Right? I think the issue is um, whenever we move to like a place we, we want to call home, the people around us or the community that we are living in also uh, has this idea that we are all global citizens, essentially. Mm -hmm where all this, like what you've mentioned about boundaries between states and territories and nations, like just um, these boundaries won't make sense, don't make sense on a personal level. So if we, probably we have that understanding on an individual um, level, then this global citizen with this idea of being a global citizen would uh, be more realistic. But unfortunately, we don't live in that kind of world yet, right? Mm -hmm. So because of the scholarship that you do, it somehow um, um, shows people like us who are not very familiar with the, um, with what's happening really on the ground and how people make sense of belongingness. So that is very enlightening for our listeners and our uh, viewers. Despite um, these challenges, um, mm -hmm. uh, we still want to be, uh, we still see our uh, future in academia, right? So what's your academic, how do you envision your academic career moving forward or your future plans? Right. Um, you know, I hope to continue to have the right motivation to ask difficult questions about the society and the world that we live in and have the necessary strength to seek answers to those questions through my research and teaching. Um, I hope to have academic longevity, despite all the challenges and the difficulties that can potentially undermine it, especially in today's context. Um, sometimes academia can induce existential 
existential this crisis and you've been witness to those episodes in my life several times especially when you're at some low points in your life but you know we love what we love so i'll continue to forge ahead and hopefully i'll never have to sell out so that's that's my hope for the future i'm sure you're not the only one having this uh, feelings especially during this uncertain time so if you have an advice to those who are thinking of pursuing their graduate uh, studies overseas what would those uh, what would be your advice Hmm. Okay. I'm not one to really give advice because, you know, personally, I don't, I don't like self-help books in general. But I feel like, I mean, it's 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 up to you. You do your own thing. But you know, if I can, if I must, um, I guess my my main advice is for you to to go for it and to do it for the right reasons. And when I say right reasons, of course, that ultimately depends on. You know how you view the purpose and essence of graduate studies. And in my case, it's really about my genuine interest in understanding the insecurities that have always bothered my existence, particularly those that are rooted, you know, in equality, in conflict, and religion, as well as my general interest and experience in life in different countries. Um, for me, academia is a way of meaning making, and it's it's, it's how I find meaning, you know, in, in life through through academia. Um, and it's only through academia that I'm able to pursue and fulfill, you know, both, both interests. Now, your reasons might be entirely different from mine, and the only way for you to, to test those reasons and see if they are worth pursuing is to, you know, stay trying. Regardless of how it's going to turn out, you will come out of it with you know, a renewed and hopefully better understanding of yourself, of others, and your surroundings. So for, for those reasons alone, I think it's, it, it's worth the try and the effort. So all the best. Mike, for those who are interested in your research, where can we find you in the vast internet? Well, for those of you who might want to know more about my research, I'd be very, very happy to hear feedbacks from you guys. Um, please uh, visit www.mycomic.com. That's one website. And then I also have you know, the usual uh, websites like accounts like um, ResearchGate and Academia.edu. If you want uh, copies of my publications, please send me an email. I'll be more than happy to send you a copy. Thank you so much, Mike, for your time today. And I hope we'll be able to meet soon after this pandemic. I can't wait to visit you in London. Thank you so much, I mean, for this opportunity. I mean, it really means a lot to me that um, you have invited me to, to do this with you. And I wish you all the very, very best. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be successful. And you know, you're one of the, one of the, I would, everybody, in my circle. You know, all agree that you're a rising superstar. Um, and I'm so, so proud of your accomplishments and your achievements. And and I hope that uh, you continue doing what you're doing, especially in research and your teaching activities. And and hope that you know we can collaborate and other projects soon, especially now that I've delved more into peace studies and conflict. I'd love to really work with you on those things. Thank you for listening to this episode. Please consider leaving a comment or rating at iTunes or any of your preferred podcast hosting platforms. For details about upcoming episodes and how to support the Scholars Unbound project, visit daliasimangan.com slash scholarsunbound with the link in our show notes.